after postgraduate course in mathematics and political science at Madras University. He taught for a couple of years at Madras Christian College. He launched the Transport Monthly Mobile in 1962 and Industrial Economist in 1968. Next month, next year, they are celebrating the Golden Jubilee. It's a very rare thing for a business magazine to complete run for 50 years. I think we should give a big hand. He has visited and written about hundreds of projects throughout India concerning steel, power, fertilizer, agricultural universities, nuclear power stations, automobile plants, etc. He has also visited the US, Germany, France, the European Commission and the FAO on invitation to cover specific projects and programs. He also covered the Prime Minister's visit to Washington in 2005 and was part of the PM's media delegation that visited UK and Finland in 2006. He has interacted with several state, several state chief ministers in India including Narendra Modi when he was the Gujarat CM. A specialist writer on agriculture, he took the initiative to set up the Agricultural Consultancy Management Foundation 10 years ago. Its aim is to improve agriculture productivity through application of science, technology and management. This evening Mr. Vishnathan will discuss the how, why and what of the latest union budget and its pros and cons. He will also discuss the budget in relation to the government's deep monetization strategy. Over to Mr. Vishnathan. Agriculture, commerce, all, all, all sort of these. 
and we used to have the advantage of discussing the major economic issues on policy matters with policy makers and they provided us uh, the opportunity also to raise issues of specific concern to our region. I was one of the two invited from the entire southern region, so I could raise some of the issues relating to the southern states. <coughs> so this is uh, one of those from uh, Chavan right up to Arun Jaitley, all the finance ministers. Some of them had long records and uh, it used to be delayed because these are mostly for background sessions. Therefore, most of the ministers also used to give backgrounders some of the things that are not for publication, they used to caution. And uh, they were very useful to get an idea of the impact of the budget on the various sections. So, the Tamil Nadu had uh, the distinction of fielding the largest number of finance ministers. If you talk also the Madras presidency of 1947 <coughs> onwards, we had uh, five of these. After uh, Moraji Desai, our Peach Chidambaram had the longest tenure as finance minister. He had two tenures in 1996, 97, 97, 98, and again under UPA two stints. But he holds the record after Moraji Desai. <coughs> this year the budget had some very interesting facets. For one, the budget was presently advanced to 1st of February. You know, we, you know the various uh, changes. Because in British time, they had to synchronize with the time of Britain. There was a time difference about five and a half hours. Therefore, for a number of years, until recently, until the time of Fashion Sina, it used to be presented at five o'clock in the evening. Because it was uh, comfortable for the British to follow what's happening. This changed it to the morning hours on the last walking day of February. And now, this year, they advance it to 1st of February. The second uh, interesting fact, as you know, is that they dispensed with a separate budget for railways after about 74 years. And uh, the Prime Minister stole the tender by the address to the nation on 31st of December announcing a scheme of uh, a number of schemes over there. And uh, the role for uh, Arun Jaitley was reduced to that extent. This was an advantageous thing to do because in the earlier system we had hardly the time to prepare the estimates and complete it. You know, normally we used to have it on the end of February and the parliament used to go for a recess on 15th of March and used to reassemble on first week of April. And by the time the demand for plans where the ministry, various ministries are passed, it will be end of April. That means we didn't have much time to implement the budget schemes from the 1st of April of the next year. The second quarter is invariably a monsoon season for most parts of India. Therefore, not much activity relating to the financial sector used to take place for the first six months. So we used to have really the budget's impact or the implementation of the various proposals of the budget only from the third quarter, which was Absurd in the sense you all would know, like our industries, everybody rushing in the marsh, our insurance agents, everything to meet targets. Most departments used to spend their last efforts to spend their allotted budget figures in March, and some of the departments used to also get lapsed. So this is a welcome thing in the sense that they are able to get the full year available to them to implement the various schemes. This gives an idea about the size of our budget. The budget size is something like about 21.47 lakh crores. It gives an idea. See, if you take our, uh, the size of uh, Tamil Nadu budget as something like, say, something close to about 1.8 lakh crores, you get an idea how many times it is larger, some 10 times or so. You get an idea of uh, the various items that contribute to the revenues. This gives the idea of where we get the revenues. I, I hope you are able to see this. The top thing, this is of course our borrowings. Later I revert to this. This is a real sad thing because 
like a family living on borrowed money. Government successfully both at the center and states have been borrowing recklessly and that is at the top, not our tax collections and other things, but the borrowings. And these are the major areas where our money is spent. Centrally sponsored schemes are at the top, that is the central schemes, central sector schemes together, they account around 21% of the budget. Different states about 9%. Interest payments again, because of our large heavy borrowings, it occupies a very high portion of our spending. This roughly gives the idea of the various components that give the revenues. That is mainly gross tax revenues, the figure I have already given. Income tax gets us something like about 4.41 lakh crores. Corporation tax about 5.39 lakh crores. Customs and excess duties together contribute something like about 6.5 lakh crores. And service tax is gaining in, uh, in uh, size. You will see after the GST is introduced, service tax occupying much higher place, as it should be because services account for 60% of total economic activity. If you take the total economic activity comprising from the agriculture sector, industrial sector and the services sector, services account for something like 60% of our revenue, of our activity and the total gross domestic products. And next comes manufacturing about 25 and about 15 from agriculture sector which is declining. Increasingly, with each finance commission, more and more resources are transferred to the state. Now you see the transfer is more than half of the total revenues of something like about 22 lakh crores. So we are having a situation where you cannot blame the centre for lack of resources, for example, to, for health. Health comes centrally under the state jurisdiction. So you can't blindly say increase allocation for health to the centre. Because the centre, after the 14th Finance Commission recommendations, has transferred many of its areas to the states, as uh, Modi has been saying, it's in the system of federal cooperative, <coughs> cooperative federalism, it has been increasingly handing more and more of the resources to the state. Therefore, we have to knock at the doors to the state for better delivery, better governance, better budgeting. Unfortunately, we don't do that much. One area which should cause a lot of concern to us is the reckless borrowing of both the centre and the states. Hardly seven, eight years ago, Tamil Nadu's total debts were in the region of 100,000 crore. Now it is in excess of 250,000 crore. For many of the schemes that they have, the freebies, the government's employment, salaries and pensions, and your, your debt repayments, debt servicing. Three items cost us more money than our revenues. The state's revenues last year, for example, was 147,000 crore. For the benefit of my friend, a crore is 10 million. Our German friend, we call it a crore. It is 10 million, right? So we have a very peculiar problem. Last year, our total revenues were something like 147,000 crore. We have the largest component of government employees in the country, 18 lakh employees. Thanks to Karana Nadi taking you, accepting you and I, everybody else in the bandwagon. We have 18 lakh, which is much, much more than the, much, the larger state of UP or much larger state of Maharashtra. What it means, on one stroke a few years ago, he brought all teachers, Anganwadi workers, everybody under the state payroll. He massively increased employment of government servants in a state country he vote 40 years ago. With the result we have a very peculiar thing. We spend 80,000 crores of rupees on salaries and pensions. Of the revenue of 147,000 crore, we have a record of spending around 75 to 80,000 crore and we are now waiting for the next three months for the recommendations of the 7th Finance Commission, Pay Commission, that is bound to have an incidence of another 12,000 crore to the minimum. So we have a situation where 
some 55 percent of the total revenue collections of the state go for one item. Then we have the freebies. We give free rice of 20 kgs. We give free fans, mixes and grinders and free thalis for uh, weddings. We give uh, so many other schemes. I don't know how many of you have an idea of how much it costs us. 68,000 crore. So, we add 80 plus 68,000, the entire revenues are eaten by these two segments alone. And you have a third component, which is debt servicing. We borrow, we have a debt of about 52,000 crore, and it's going to increase further this budget after the budget, day after tomorrow. How you service it? You have to pay interest on it, and you also have to repay a portion of the debt. So that accounts was another about 30,000 crore. So we have a situation where your revenues are about 147,000 crore and the expenditure on just three items, forget about others, is 180,000 crore. So we don't have money for any development scheme. So if you don't find many bridges being built, you don't find any infrastructure investment, you don't find rickety buses in our state transport corporations. We can now understand why the government is not able to spend any money on any development work, which essentially means our going for more borrowings this year and more debt repayments and that cycle becomes extremely vicious. The situation is not very different for Center. The profligacy started in the 80s under Indira Gandhi and later with Rajiv Gandhi. We went for reckless sets of imports. We look at our budget, our total debt in 1881. It is less than 60,000 crore. Year after year, our debts have been increasing. It is now something close to 70 lakh crore. I don't know whether it makes an impact. And uh, in recent years, I, I'm running a business, you're all, most of you are in business, you can understand the impact of reckless borrowing, where it will end. And unfortunately, even the centre, unfortunately, doesn't have much money for development schemes. And uh, after the 2008 global meltdown, Pranab Mukherjee indulged in absolute profligate borrowings. Normally we used to borrow around 300,000 crore to meet the gap. He increased it to 500,000 crore and is now exploding further. So we have a situation where the debts are eating into our vitals and uh, if the economy is on a low growth, if the economy is not growing much, if the tax revenues are not growing to expected level, you have a dip in tax revenues and as a result you have to keep on borrowing more. This is an extremely tough situation and particularly the growth has been much slower since 19, 2011. Therefore we are having the problem of inability to spend on development, jobs are scarce and international positions are also pretty weak. I mentioned about the service tax, it was introduced as in a small way some, uh, nearly two decades ago and it has been increasing year after year. Now, after the GST, this is going to receive a further increase, you know, the GST system will reduce taxes on manufactured products. Therefore, your cars or refrigerators and other things, you will have much less taxes on the less taxes on them they may become cheaper, they, they have to become cheaper. But your services are bound to be higher. Your rental income, for example, you are paying 15% on rental income, you have to pay 18%. So the service tax component will increase. Where are the green shoots we are seeing? The new government under Modi over the last two, three years has been trying to introduce certain reforms in certain areas. The most visible of this you are able to see in terms of power. You know, successive plans 
it will take uh, for a number of years. The targets and the achievements were the wide gap. If you if analyze from 1992, every five years we used to have the targets set and the achievements. For 20 long years, from 50, 25 long years, from 1992 to 2007, our achievements in power sector have been less than 60 percent of target set. It used to be for the first three five year plans in that uh, period, it used to be less than 50 percent. There was an improvement in the 19, uh, 2007 to 12. A remarkable change has happened in the last five years. This for the first time in several decades the performance has been excess of target set, 115 percent of what targets were set. That's why you don't see any power outages of the time we experienced in 2011 and 2012. And this has happened across the country. So if the plans go well, all villages in our country will get power within the next five years and the quality will also improve. And a more interesting thing, we discussed it in our last issue, the more interesting thing is that we will be getting out of coal as a main source. You know, for a number of years we have been fighting in global uh, fora that uh, we as a developing country must have the right to burn more coal and contribute to global warming. Because we are developing, we didn't uh, do as much as what uh, US did or China did. But quietly and uh, interestingly, we will face out coal as a main raw material for uh, power production after the next 10 years. There will be zero use of coal for producing power. There will be going, switching large scale to non-conventional non -conventional electricity sources. One major development that should be welcome for all of us. The matter for concern is the very poor tax collection. Income tax collections have been extremely poor because Every section is adept in tax avoidance and there are ingenious methods of doing this. Can you believe for a population of 126 crore, hardly a crore are taxpayers, income taxpayers. Only 3% register for income tax, file any type of uh, returns for income tax. Of these they get so many exemptions, hardly 1 crore. 10 million pay income taxes. So this is something the matter should be seriously concerned with. Our chartered accountants and other good friends in business and all, we work hard to see loopholes in trying not to pay taxes. And uh, this must be a matter of pride for us to get larger sections under the tax net. I'm, I'm sure I'm not going to be popular uh, recommending to set a businessman here. But any country, take U.S. for instance, every activity in U.S. is taxed. A girl comes into the McDonald uh, thing. She works for three hours. She gets paid uh, at six dollars an hour, eighteen dollars. She ten percent is deducted and she's paid uh, the balance. Every activity, if I'm a, I'm a student in a university, my stipend is taxed. Every tax, every income comes under this net. Hopefully. I think the digitization, the digital India method, all these will help bring much larger sections under the tax net, which should be welcome because we are all, <coughs> we are all prospering. There is no reason why all of us should avoid, excepting the salary age, the government employees and others. Other sections revel in avoiding taxes or not paying taxes. And you know, I had an interesting discussion with uh, Nazim Zaidi, I'm trying to present him in Chennai in the next couple of months. And uh, he was mentioning the extremely sad state of affairs in political funding. 86%, 85% of uh, income received by the various political parties are not accounted for in any way. Karnataka used to say the entire contribution for DMP used to come through 10 paise and 15 paise. So every party says this. So this budget has attempted to some extent to bring it down 
but bringing it down from 20,000 to 2,000 may not make much thing because all that it needs to have 10 names instead of one name for 20,000. Of course, we need reforms in the electoral sector in a very big way to attack the black money issue. The demonetization issue has been discussed widely and as I said, next to budget, next to agriculture, next to cinema and politics, everybody has an opinion on demonetization in this country. Therefore, you should all be very familiar with this. You should have been bombarded with this day in and day out. I am only mentioning one small green shoot in that. The demonetization has resulted in <coughs> issuing fresh currencies and getting the old notes back into the banking system. The major advantage in this is that the government now has a record of the monies with 18 lakh people or 70 lakh people, whoever are deposited, all these have been recorded. Of course, it is voluminous data. You require an army of data analytics professionals to go through that and get into the root of this. So at least in future transactions, hopefully, See, you see, the, you see the thing, average deposit size is 3.31 crore for 18 lakh deposits. So they will be investigating it and hopefully some more money may come into this and the menace of black money, you know, Chennai, Tamil Nadu holds uh, uh, the record for, uh, for this type of uh, transactions in every transaction in the world. We have institutional corruption so fantastically Bangalore. and everything you know from registration to getting a power connection to water connection to every damn thing you have corruption all pervading and uh, you see the you see the filing of returns of our politicians municipal councillors MLAs MPs and others between two elections you can see the huge jump in their incomes they, they may not have uh, had a even few lakhs of income, but now suddenly they find them owning 50 crore, which you would not have seen after 50 years of working in a business. Therefore, this change can be brought about by a better computerized system where the data should be available with the government over vast areas. The immediate impact of the uh, the budget was at uh, the census jumped uh, close to 500 points and the economy seems to have uh, more hope of gathering momentum. And uh, <coughs> the main point of the budget as you see is the merger of the railway budget in this and the railways were dispensed with just five minutes instead of one full day earlier. It's just a serious part of the government why, why spend too much time on this and we had in Suresh Prabhu, a brilliant professional who didn't bother about like our Lalu Prasad or other uh, Mamta Banerjee. He didn't want to have the limelight one thing, Yigdin uh, Kasultran, the type of uh, thing they, he didn't bother to. Therefore, he has quite been much with this and uh, I think uh, this will bring about much better coordinated development of the entire service transport, surface transport. If you say the plus points on this, there are no big bang announcements in the budget. We had they focus to expand income tax base, fiscal consolidation, rural economy and infrastructure, which is a dream of every budget. Uh, Arun Jaitley has continued with that. The greater attention has been paid to MSME sector, which is supposed to <coughs> handle about 40% of our manufacturing and 45, economic activity and 40% of exports. So that should be a welcome thing. <coughs> They are also planning a mega mega oil company in the western part. They are going to spend something like 75,000 crore in Maharashtra. It's a huge investment. And uh, they will be merging all the oil related companies into one large company of great size. And internationally it can compete from the stage of exploration to production to marketing. <laughs> and everything will be combined. But on the minus side or what Jetley could have done, include a certain target to bring more people under the tax net. I have been crying hoes on this for over 30 years to little effect. Hopefully this uh, computerization and other things will take our country to the next stage 
can we target bringing 10 crore of people under the tax net? Is it possible? What do we need to do? How do we streamline it? That's one concern. Agriculture has been escaping income tax. Most industries quietly spend, including my friend who is at our Suresh, most industries quietly spend money on agriculture and negotiations. Uh, and uh, this is one outlet for people to take the money out and put it on this. And this also gives rise to a lot of scope for manipulation. You can write off a lot of items as agriculture losses. Nobody can scrutinize this. Therefore, there is some sense in agriculture is going to be more profitable occupation, there is going to be agglomeration hopefully and agriculture will emerge as a business. And in that case, there is no reason why agriculture should be kept out of the income tax net. And there are so many discretions, so many relaxations, so many <coughs> exemptions, reductions. So corporation tax, though we say it is 33 percent, hardly the average is only about 19 percent. There is no need to keep it high and then give so many exemptions. So we will be moving towards 25 percent of corporation tax anyway and these exemptions will be removed in quick time. And the greatest worry for us is how to prevent the generation of black money. Now the academic season is going to end and my last issue, Dr. M. Krishna has written the pervasive corruption involved. You know, Dr. Krishna was the Vice Chancellor of Anna University and was the Chairman of Kanpur IIT for a number of years, an outstanding educationist. He has openly mentioned, I have published it, that the, that the bribe involved for a Vice Chancellor's post in Anna University is 5 crore to 50 crore and that is taken by the governor of Tamil Nadu. So he has made an open uh, statement on this. And uh, you know the Public Service Commission of uh, Madras, it recently recruited, Jailalta recruited 11 in one shot. Within nine were, did they have anything to do with uh, administration or uh, governance, they were lawyers, or the Punjab you'd call lawyers. So nine plus two, others and the High Court said the whole method was wrong and dismissed all of them in one stroke. Why they wanted so many in that public service commission is each job given by the government has a tag of one lakh or more or two lakhs or more, a teacher, a policeman, name any job and that is a perennial source of income for them. That's why Karnataka is so happy about 18 lakh government employees there is money in this and you are going to see the capitation fee increasing this year because with the NEAT, the NEAT system coming for medical admission, there will be more pressure on engineering and you see the capitation fee of various colleges are going to hit the sky and it, uh, you see the flourish of so many of the engineering colleges, where from do they get the money? Can they get it on just to the semester fees? Is there all outright <coughs> Capitation taken in black, uh, 5 lakhs, 10 lakhs, 50 lakhs taken in black. And uh, we need to devise some schemes whereby this can be stopped. This is, a, this is like a cancer eating into our vitals. And uh, as mentioned earlier, job growth in recent years has been abysmal. And that is going to create, you know, apart from our politicians, uh, Many of our politicians, our students are also are jobless and that's the reason you get so many of them into the lax assembly in Marina or in Nadiwasal at the top of a hat. So this is a very serious issue for us. We take accepting Congress, DMK and MD, DMK, others don't have any place in the assembly now. That means they got the MDMK, DMDK, your uh, Congress, your other parties or Vijay Kant, they were uh, PMK, all of them are jobless. Therefore, they are all ready for any agitation anywhere in the state. <laughs> so this is another very serious thing. We need to be concerned about it because we don't need so many parties and uh, where from they go for the resources, God knows. And uh, they <coughs> live on this perpetuation of this bribe system. And uh, we have to 
do something about the job opportunity. Tamil Nadu particularly is in a very serious stage because growth has slowed down and uh, there are many engineering colleges, they don't even have enough uh, uh, students strength in that. I described some of these in some detail because the economic growth is vital to us now. We have all the good factors for emerging an extremely strong economy. Whether it is agriculture, whether it is industry, whether it is services. India has been extremely well endowed. I, I travel extensively looking at agricultural farms in US and elsewhere. All over India I have seen these things. We have natural advantage which no other country has to a comparable it's a large arable land of 400 million acres. We have season that runs through the entire year. We can raise 365 days agriculture in most parts of India. You can't do that in US. You start in April, you close shop by September. There's no everywhere. I can't do it in most parts of Europe. The third, we have a tradition of raising crops for hundreds of thousands of years. And therefore, there is no reason why we should be content with low levels of productivity. So we needed to focus on agricultural productivity improvements I was discussing with Suresh when you are coming. The scope, you know, our productive levels are abysmal. We take uh, 5 tons of tomato an acre, and California takes 80 tons, and Israel takes 200 tons an acre. We take uh, 800 kg of uh, corn. In Midwest US, they take 10,000 kg of corn per acre. And there is not rocket science. We can achieve quantum jumps by simple common sense issues. So we needed to focus on this, which every one of us can do that. It doesn't need a great scientific thing. And our ISRO has done wonderful work. If you see the type of analysis they have done 30 years ago in terms of mapping the entire country in terms of soil, in terms of water source and all. But unfortunately, these are like Picasso drawings, all green and orange and yellow. We don't have the system to deliver or translate this to the Kupusami and Kupun and Suban in the forms. We can do that easily with some efforts and you can all look into the prospects for this. Likewise, even in services, IT is going to receive some hit now because of uh, Trump and other uh, slowdown. We have so many other areas to apply these things for our own requirements. You know, TCS or Infos is hardly used. 10% of their thing for Indian use, 90% is going for exports. Can we have a system whereby this type of use will be all pervasive for small industry, for agriculture, for the Kirana shop and everything. We have seen that happening. Lots of things. There is a demonetization. There is a much bigger, faster switch to, and to uh, plastic economy or non-cash economy. I think Modi, after the recent success in the UP and Uttarakhand will be most bold. I do expect uh, some major reforms in the coming weeks and uh, we do hope the country will draw its full potential to grow as a very strong nation across the world. Thank you very much. You see the contrast of how the developed countries have expanded this base. You know, we have progressively increased the limit for minimum tax. Today up to 5 lakhs, more or less you can get away 